For much of this semester, we've focused on molecular orbital theory to explain the reactivity of organic compounds. Now it's time to extend this to transition metal complexes. Before we dive into their molecular orbital diagrams, let's quickly review how we constructed MO diagrams for organic molecules. In general, we think about all of the available orbitals on each atom. These are determined by the geometry, and hence hybridization, of that atom. Then we look at which orbitals point at each other. These make sigma bonds or pi bonds and corresponding antibonding orbitals. Orbitals that don't overlap with other orbitals remain as non-bonding orbitals. Then we fill the diagram from the bottom up with all the available electrons. We follow the same general approach with transition metals, but we have to make a few simplifications. Instead of considering all the available orbitals on the transition metal and the ligands, we focus on the transition metal's most important valence orbitals, the d orbitals, and only focus on the orbitals of the ligands that can interact with those d orbitals. For now, we'll just focus on the ligand orbitals that are donating to the metal in their Lewis base capacity, typically the homos of the ligands. In general, the ligand donor orbitals are lower in energy than the metal d orbitals, so when they make bonds, the bonding orbitals are closer in energy to the ligand-based orbitals, and the antibonding orbitals are closer to the metal's d orbitals. The key is identifying which d orbitals the ligands point at, and how directly. The biggest difference between organic compounds and transition metals is that a single d orbital can interact with multiple ligand-based orbitals. Let's see how this works for a generic octahedral coordination complex. The six ligands are arranged along the x, y, and z axes, two to an axis. Of the five d orbitals, the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared are the only two to point at the ligands, so those are the ones that make bonds. The dx squared minus y squared orbital has bonding interactions with the four ligands in the xy plane, and the dz squared orbitals has strong bonding interactions with the two lig ligands along the z-axis. In addition, the dz squared orbitals torus, the piece, the hula hoop around its midsection, also points to the four ligands in the xy plane a little bit. This means that all the ligands interact with the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared orbitals. So the ligand orbitals all go down in energy, and those two d orbitals go up in energy. For reasons that we won't worry about, it so happens that both of the d orbitals go up by exactly the same energy. They're degenerate. The remaining three d orbitals, those that didn't overlap with the ligand orbitals, remain non-bonding. The non-bonding and antibonding orbitals, those closest in energy to the original metal's d orbitals, are sometimes referred to as the d-splitting diagram of the complex. They are the frontier molecular orbitals, and this particular arrangement is characteristic of all octahedral compounds. The dxy, dxz, and dyz orbitals are non-bonding, with the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared orbitals relatively high in energy and antibonding. The gap, or splitting, between the non-bonding and antibonding orbitals is often called delta octahedral, or delta O. To populate the diagram with electrons, we use the total electron count, starting at the bottom and populating all those with electrons, and moving our way up in energy. Alternatively, we can almost always just fill all the bonding orbitals and use the d electron count to tell us how many electrons fill the d-splitting diagram. The same method can be applied to any geometry. For square planar, all four ligands are oriented exactly along the x and y axes, so the brunt of the overlap is felt by the dx squared minus y squared orbital. 
In fact, the splitting of this orbital is exactly the same as it was for an octahedral complex, delta O. But the torus of the dz squared orbital, that little donut around the middle, also overlaps a little bit with the ligand orbitals. The result is that the dxy, dxz, and dyz orbitals are non-bonding. The dx, sorry, the dz squared orbital is slightly anti-bonding. And the dx squared minus y squared is quite high in energy. This is the classic d orbital splitting diagram for a square planar complex. Finally, let's look at a tetrahedral complex. By convention, a tetrahedral complex has the axes more or less bisecting the pairs of ligands, like this. This means that the dx squared minus y squared and dz squared orbitals don't point directly at any ligands. But the three other d orbitals do. Because of the weird 109.5 degree bond angles, the overlap between those three d orbitals and the ligand orbitals isn't perfect. They don't overlap directly. As a result, the amount of splitting, which we call delta tetrahedral, or delta T, is smaller than for octahedral complexes. Four-ninths the size, to be, pre to be precise.